this conference will now be recorded. We know the meeting is being recorded. Um, Hunter, will you acknowledge that you were uh, okay with getting a uh, email of notification of the commission meeting? I, I did receive it and I, I'm okay with it. Natalie, okay, so excuse me, since you're recording after you've taken the role with the let the record reflect that a quorum is present of both bodies of each body. okay thank okay. you okay so we we've already taken the role um there is a quorum present for both the election commission and the election board um on the election commission wendy burgess is the only member that's not uh present all other members are present okay and then uh my second item on the commission's agenda is the approval of the minutes of january 10th Meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. I don't know why y'all can't see me. I'm trying to get the video up, but that's me. Okay, I have a motion by Rick Barnes. Do I have a second? Second, Mayor Louise. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Otter. My uh, second item on my agenda for the election board is the approval of the minutes of the January 10, 2020 meeting. Um, they're attached I'll to move the, approval. Uh, I'll second. Um, we have a motion from the judge and a second from the sheriff. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Hyder, take it away with the discussion of our upcoming uh, July primary runoff. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, what we have today is basically a rundown of, uh, I believe, three items. Summarize. If you can mute your mic, please. If you're not speaking, that would help a little bit. Um, so a rundown of what the scope of the election is, uh, where we are with this, what safety protocols we have given the uh, situation with the pandemic. And I know that um, there, I assume there would be some questions about the CARES Act funds and the grant that we got and how we are preparing for uh, elections down the road in November. So I'm gonna start with the scope of the July 14 election. Um, so we started with a countywide election, of course. Uh, parties initially uh, wanted to retain all the locations that we used back in March, that was 192. But as the days have moved forward, uh, that number and that availability has been uh, de decreasing. We have some locations that we have not been able to reach agreements with, private facilities, churches. Uh, that uh, We had one that wanted an, uh, us to have uh, insurance and a contract uh, assuming liability for certain things that, that were not doable. So when I prepared this, it was 178. I got an email uh, not about an hour ago saying that there are four more that are being revised uh, and are still up in the air. So that I think is just a reflection of what could be one of the biggest challenges for November, securing location. Um, I don't think it's gonna be dropping significantly from this point, probably four or five more. Uh, we should be around 175, give or take two or three, depending on what happens with these four. So that's that's pretty much the footprint we have. We're talking about almost 2,000 poll workers we started recruiting. Uh, so far, we haven't had any big challenges finding uh, volunteers and people to work. We still have some spots open with each of the parties. Uh, I believe the last one, that was two days ago I asked, and uh, we had a little under 20, I believe, uh, for the Democratic Party and about three for the Republican Party judges. But as we move forward, I'm sure that we're going to be able to cover those uh, positions. Uh, we don't see a, a big, we don't have a major concern right now. It doesn't feel different than what the usual process to get ready for the election has been in the past. One um, change compared to the, uh, let's say, the, the, the way primary runoffs have been run in the past is that uh, because of the pandemic, the governor has extended early voting for an additional week. So uh, we are going to start early voting on June 29th and run for two weeks. Uh, there will be two days in the middle, uh, Friday, July 3rd, and Saturday, July 4th, that are holidays. 
there won't be early voting those days. But uh, again, we're having a full week in addition to what we've had in the past, which would have been a usual just Monday through Friday. Um, and then we also have the uh, city election from Fort Worth. That was the only election that the governor authorized to be postponed to a date different than the November general date. Uh, so this is the CCPD election. It will be happening at the same time as the primary runoff. So how is that going to happen? What we, uh, the way we set up the system is a voter that comes in can go to, of course, the Republican or the Democratic judge. But if they intend to vote only in the city election, they can go to either one. And there will be an option in the, in the electronic poll book to say city only ballot. And so that way a voter like, and I, and I will give you the example, like myself, I live in Fort Worth and I don't vote in primaries uh, out of a personal choice. I still can go to either one of these stations and say, I want a city only ballot and vote on the measure of the city of Fort Worth if I choose to. Uh, so that's, that's gonna be the one thing that's gonna be uh, visually different for poll workers is that they're, they're going to feel, the judges are gonna say, well, I'm the Republican or I'm the Democratic judge. What does this city only ballot mean, right? So um, that's being explained, that will be explained to them as they come in for their, their training refresher. Any questions on this so far? Looks like Deborah's trying to. No, yeah, no questions, but I did want to tell you, I wanted it to go on record. I wanted to thank Hyder and Rick Barnes. Um, when we initially started, we did start with 191, two locations. Um, Hyder right. had asked us about limiting that. I did not want to, given the uh, what had happened in the March election. And so I wanted to keep as many locations as possible. Rick was supportive of that and I thank him. And as a result, um, Hyder, I, you know, we know that we may be at 178 or 174, but that's just because of location things. And we wanted to keep as many open as possible. And I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I have to say that um, there's been a lot of, um, it's gotten better if you compare to six weeks ago there was a lot more hesitation from all the entities involved a lot more uncertainty and what it meant to uh, open up a building for uh, having an election while there were stay-at-home orders and things like that but um, it's turned around a little bit and it's gotten way way better and uh, yeah uh, the Republican Party was was great in that meeting and said you know let's we, since we both need to be there uh, we'll be there to make sure that we have all the locations available so thank you for Making that Potter, when is quick, your training um, beginning? Potter, when is your training beginning? In uh, the early voting training begins next week. And the week after that, uh, the judges are going to start coming in. We're not going to do a full training. Uh, most of these judges just did the election in March. We're going to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, 30 minutes, to explain to them the use of the PPE uh, and the small changes we have, like the city-only ballot and they will have equipment set up in case they want to try again, but it's not going to be the full uh, four or five hour class that we did in March. Uh, we feel pretty comfortable. Now, there are some judges that are going to be brand new. So for them, we're going to carve out uh, the time we need to do a full training, uh, but that's a, that's a smaller group up to this point. Hi there, I have a question. It's Mary Louise. Yes, ma'am. So um, what is the backup plan or what does the contract say you have the 178 committed. Now you're thinking maybe it goes to 174. Say, you know, COVID takes a turn and now the people we're in contracts with are freaked out. They have a governing body saying, we're not using our building. Are we in any type of situation where based on tomorrow's news that somebody can say, sorry, Hyder, we're not opening up our church or whatever. Where are we in the contract and maybe uh, one of the attorneys can speak to that. I'm just curious because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know the fear of, you know, stakeholders that say you can't come in the building now. No, that is, that is, a, that's a great question. And that is a, a risk that is um, there. Uh, private facilities can choose to back down. That's what's been happening with some of these churches. Uh, public buildings can't. We are still waiting for the advisory from the SOS, putting some language to that effect. Uh, but we've made it clear to all the cities and schools that public buildings, by law, have to be made available. And I'll go into that a little bit later when looking down the road for November. But private facilities, good. We, we cannot force someone to open the door for us on, a, on private property. Um, I don't, 
I don't know how to measure that for you because I can't predict how bad the pandemic will get. Um, but we have a list of locations that we've been, you know, exploring and depending on what location may have a cancellation, we, we just have to look for alternatives around them. Part of this has also been trying to be consistent with what we did in March. So we don't have voters going one place, then to another, then another one in November, right? So we really want to try to stay uh, as much as we can in the same place within the same area so people find it easy to know where to go to. Uh, even if they don't live in the area, they have someone in the area, they, they always see the same vote here sign in front of the same school or the same library. So we're part of this effort has been that, staying as much as we can in those places. Okay, so I know, I mean, you, there's no way for us to know the future, but I will suggest that your team figures out where the private locations are and always have the plat, you know, backup B plan to throw out on a website to say, you know, five is shut down, here's the plan, here's where we're going to send people and just really kind of have those dominoes ready to fall already. Um, just knowing where your private facilities are and just always say one's going to close, two's going to close, five's going to close and have everything ready to push out because I just think if this thing takes an ugly turn, it's just going to it's just going to create mayhem for everybody. Yeah, and there are areas. I mean, it, it is. We we have. I mean, we have our database with all the locations we know in the county. Um, this conversation, obviously, and I'm, I'm generalizing, but this has to go through uh, Chair Peoples and Chair Barnes as chairs of the parties for July because it's their election, right? We obviously will come up and say, hey, we suggest we move from this church to this um, city hall or this school. Uh, but then there's a matter of, you know, if you change a school gym where you could fit 20 machines or a city hall lobby where you can fit six, um, that that could be a problem. I mean, you're still coming up with the same number of locations, but now you have less capacity. Um, it's better than nothing, I'll give you that. But those are identified, but we got to kind of wait until if they start telling us to tell you, OK, this one's happening. We're proposing to move here and see where, where party chairs would like to go for July. I appreciate it. Thank you. So that's what we have in hand. It's not much different. The scope, um, I would say it is larger than previous primary runoffs. Uh, previous primary runoffs usually kind of downsize the uh, scope of the election. This one actually uh, maintained at least uh, the intention to begin with. Right? We didn't go from 180 to 150 and then scale down from there. We went from 192 to 192 and scale down from there. So that's probably the highlight of this one. That and the um, the addition to joint with the city of Fort Worth. Now, on top of that, of course, here's the, the important part, the safety protocols in the context of COVID. So what are we doing uh, for July that's different to, to uh, tackle this situation? Well, first one is, as you know, voters show up at polling places and they queue up at the door. So the first and obvious one, and I think it's almost an automatic right now, is that people need to be social distanced. Uh, even before they go into the place, polling place. So we're going to provide simplest of solutions, painter's tape to mark those lines, much like you see at supermarket and venues um, to say, you know, this is six feet between them. Obviously there's a limit to how far down the, the street poll workers can go to make these marks, uh, but we'll have some staff uh, walking down the line to say, hey, reminding people uh, you need to try to keep social uh, the proper distance, right? Uh, when they come into the polling place, our dear beloved poll workers uh, are going to look a little different. We are going to be providing them uh, face masks, face shields, and rubber gloves. Right. Uh, I have actually one here. I can show you quickly. So they'll have these. Um, and, and the reason we're giving them these is because something that we have seen commonly in uh, public in places where uh, people have to work with the public is those plexiglass barriers, right? The glass to, to cover the counter. If I owned all the buildings, I would drill them in. Uh, the problem is that these are tables we rent. These are spaces that change. And I didn't feel comfortable putting up a plexiglass barrier that someone may lean into and knock over and create a problem at the polling place. So we figured the other best thing we could do was to provide these face shields, which is the equivalent to having that barrier. And on top of that, they um, if they have to get up from the table to assist the voter in the voting machine, they still have the protection with them. So that will be there beside uh, on top of the masks and the masks and the gloves, right? So that's for the poll workers. For the voter, or in general for the polling place, we're also um, providing hand sanitizer. 
for every location. There's uh, plenty of it. We're still um, waiting for some shipments to come in, but we have plenty right now. And we found these uh, nice little devices. Uh, we placed the order last week. They should be here early next week. Uh, and the intent of this is basically you grab your pen, you grab, and I'm gonna show you in a minute why, you grab a pen and you slide it in one way and the voter pulls it out the other way and it comes out all sanitized and covered in alcohol. It has a wet sponge in it with, with the alcohol. And so the goal is that we're gonna provide the voter with a marking stylus that has been sterilized right there on the fly, right? So now they're, once they've scrubbed their hands, shown the ID, they're given the stylus through this device and they pull it and now they have a clean device that's been wiped with alcohol in their hand. And what the voter is going to do is walk to the voting machine and use that stylus to make their choice selections on the voting machine. And they also would have used it in the uh, electronic poll book to sign in, right? So they grab the clean pen, they choose their party or city only ballot, they do their signature, and then they move on to the voting machine and using the same stylus they haven't shared with anyone, they make their choices, they grab their ballot and they go. The stylus goes into a used bucket that's brought back to the poll worker and then they grab it and to the next voter, pass it through the alcohol again. So everyone should be receiving a uh, sanitized marking uh, or stylus, if you will. On top of that, even, even though there's, what we try to achieve here is a contact-free experience with the voting machine, um, poll workers are still gonna be provided with alcohol wipes, or wipes um, soaked in the sanitizing solution and asked to be wiping down the machines uh, at intervals no greater than an hour. So we're saying every hour, if you're too um, busy, don't go over an hour, but they may do it every 30, 45 minutes. We're gonna leave it at their discretion, but to uh, ask them not to do it in intervals bigger than an hour. And then last, when the voter is done, um, they'll go to the scanner and there's gonna be more hand sanitizer. So the idea is they put their ballot in, then they scrub their hands, and then they leave the polling place. Um, we're gonna really make emphasis on the, uh, with the poll workers on the training that make sure you scrub your hands after you've put your ballot in. We don't want you know wet ballots being put in the scanner and things like that. Uh, so that's the last step. Um, so if you think about it, what's gonna happen is, yeah, the poll worker is going to have that, the, uh, the, the voter is going to have, what we're trying to achieve here is a contactless experience. Just walk in, get your device, do everything you need with it, grab your paper, put it through the machine, put it in the scanner, scrub again, and walk out. There's gonna be some material we're gonna be start sharing um, this late this week or early next week. We've done some guidelines. Uh, these posters are gonna be in all the polling places in all three languages. It's a one, two, three for voters. What, uh, what are we recommending when you vote in person? Practice social distancing, end the line in the polling place. Uh, wear a mask or face cover. It's, it's highly recommended. We have, um, our, our budget and purchasing department have been great. They've given us 500,000 face masks that we have. Uh, we can provide if you don't have one, but we're still recommending, you know, bring your own. Uh, and these times where everybody's running around, you know, if, if we have 100,000 masks that we can give back to public health after the election, I'm sure they'll be appreciative of it. So if you have your own voter, bring it. It's highly recommended. Now, um, Important to make it clear to voters, even if you're wearing a face mask or a face cover, when you hand your ID, if the judge needs to see your face to verify the ID, you need to pull it down, show your face, and then pull it back up, okay? Um, that, that's just the purpose of validating ID. The judge, the judge is not mandated to ask you to remove your cover or to lower it. If they can recognize you just with the ID and the mask on, I would recognize my wife with a mask on. I don't need to ask her to do that. But if you know they, it's someone they don't know and they're not sure, they do and they will say, please lower your mask for a minute. I need to see your face. And then a simple scrub and scrub out, right? Walk into the polling place before you touch anything, hand sanitizer, and when you're done, hand sanitizer again as you walk out. So that's the one, two, three that we're going to be um, sharing with the public. Uh, and it'll be in posters. Like I said, it's in all three languages. Uh, for, there you go, so that voters who uh, require assistance in these languages can, can see them and, and have them, you know, and share them between now and early voting, beginning of early voting and election day. So that's, that's what the general plan is. 
um, very targeted at, again, allowing as little contact interaction or, or yeah, facilitating an experience that is as contactless as possible. Some other considerations that you're going to hear me talking about in, in, in public. Um, I said we have plenty, but we want to tell people, you know, there's only so many we can have. And then there's also the matter of where they are, right? And we're vote centers, so I can't, I can't anticipate that 5,000 people are going to show up here. So we're going to give every location two, three, five hundred, a thousand, depending on what the turnout is. But that means there is a limit to it. So um, again, the recommendation, bring your own. We love having kids at polling places. We have stickers for them, but in these circumstances, we will recommend if you can not bring your kid, it might be healthier for everyone, um, but that's a personal choice. It's just a, an opinion here. Uh, study your ballot, and this might be more in place for November. Uh, I tell everyone, the faster you're in Nevada, the polling place, and anywhere in general, the less exposed you are, but more also in a sense of, as a community, you know, every, five seconds every 10 seconds that each voter um, uh, saves by knowing their ballot ahead of time is 10 minutes, 50 minutes less the person at the end of the line is waiting. And at some point, everyone's the one at the end of the line, right? Um, so, so it's a matter of if we all just prepare and come in and save, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds, uh, it, it benefits us all together. The last one, curbside is available. There has been a big discussion about curbside. But curbside is not designed to process a million voters. Curbside is a method of voting that is intended for people who cannot make it into the polling place. Um, we will, no one will deny anyone curbside voting, but I do want people to understand if every single person in the county tries to vote curbside, your lines are gonna go around the block uh, and it might be midnight and we still have a line of cars. Curbside is a slower process. It's not meant to be, um, efficient in terms of time. It's meant to be uh, uh, effective for someone who can't come into the polling place. So that's really important. Uh, we've talked to other counties through this process in Texas who've done a time and motion studies and they've told us, no way, we, we dropped the idea on day one, you know, in their own parking lot with their own staff who know the process, who try to make it work quick and they said it's, it's just unmanageable. The other thing is um, we're going to have this election in July, in the middle of the summer, and um, having a curbside crew stand there 14 hours waiting car, car after car can be can be uh, brutal, and you can try to rotate them and do it, but that's something important to consider. So we'll be doing, um, we'll be providing some water to some of our staff who's doing deliveries and setups and all this physical activity to try to help them with that. But one of the things we're trying to look at is where we can do reductions of wait times and service times, right? Because especially for outdoor activities, of course, and, and physical activities, because we could be talking about an election day with 100, 102 degrees outside, and, and that's, that's difficult. And that leads me to a point that I um, is probably where we're going to have a longer discussion is the equipment distancing. So when you look at the polling place, and I intentionally chose this one just to illustrate, because they're all different flavors of polling places. They're bigger, they're smaller ones. And you try to split the equipment apart six feet between machines um, in spaces like this one, this is a real diagram from a real location, your only choice is to have less equipment. And just running some initial numbers um, on the size and some of the things, we realized that if you take the number of locations we have and you try to space everything six feet apart, you're talking about cutting the number of machines down between 40 and 60%. Now, that number, we can review it and do you know a one by one, and we'll, we will do it for November, but what I want to um, bring to discussion here is we cannot guarantee that every machine will be six feet apart from every other machine in every polling place because the only way to achieve that, there's only two ways to do it. You under equip uh, and you're going to have longer lines. And like I said, July is not the month to have someone five hours outside in the summer. Um, or we would have to go from 192 to probably 300 locations. Uh, which we're clearly, we, you know, even getting the 192 has been a challenge. So in places that have more space available, our staff's going to do everything they can to keep them as far out as they can. Um, but right now we're providing this number of machines based on what the turnout in March told us for each party. So if you need 12, we're giving you 12. 
Um, and, you know, if those 12 are in a place where the best you can do is space them out three feet, then they'll be three and not six feet apart. Uh, again, cutting them down in half is saying the line is no longer an hour, the line is two hours long because we just cut the number of machines in half. That, um, I'm going to stop here because I'm assuming that there's going to be a discussion and questions around this. So I'll open up right now, parentheses, if we want to talk about this. Hi there. This is, this is Deborah, and I just wanted to say I know that we had deferred our discussion on this until today, but I know that Rick has been very gracious about um, the number of machines, because given what happened in March, we knew that we needed, uh, the Democrats needed more machines. So I am glad that Rick is on here now. So just asking a question, because like in Como, uh, Dorothy uh, DuBose, who is the election judge there, has already brought up the question of space. I know that in March, uh, Rick, you all worked with Dorothy and gave her some more machines, but does that mean we could bleed into each other's space? So, Hyder, that's to you. I just physically, uh, yeah, physically, uh, if that means, uh, just say we ended up with, let's say, I'm going to use Como as an example. Let's say we started with 12, but we now need 15. How would that affect the placement of those machines? So, our plan, when, when we do these diagrams, you know, and, and I don't know if I can use a pencil here. No, I can't see. I can't see the diagram. Okay, your example. I, for oh, some okay, reason, okay. I see it. So when you when you um when we do the layout, right? We know that this is your here we go. This is your building, mm -hmm. and we kind of split it in half, and you have a string of machines and a string of machines on this side, right? And so we're gonna give you the number of machines that the 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 allocation calculated. So if mm -hmm. you need eight and and Rick needs eight, you're both gonna get a string of eight, one next to each other. I don't, that is not a, it's not a technical challenge or a technical question there because, and, and we saw this in March, uh, in some locations, some judges from, you know, at the end of the day gave their machines over to the other party and, and you know, it could be done. I think it's a matter of how you want to operate and, and if we want to do this balancing. Now, part of the discussion we had back in March was also, um, I can understand that, you know, if, 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 and I'll do it the other way around, if Rick is swamped in one place and he says, you know, can I borrow these machines here? I understand that you would say, well, how do I know I'm not going to need them at the end of the day? Because the numbers in March, you know, said that the end of the day, that's that's why we calculated. That's why we're giving you eight, because the, the worst hour of the day is supposed to require those eight. That's going to be a, like it was in March, kind of a case by case discussion between the two of you and saying, hey, look, um, Deborah, this is happening here. Happening here. Um, Rick wants me to ask you this or your colleague and let me know what you agree on. Technically, it's not undoable. It's just uh, a matter of what you've each allocated based on the turnout you had in March. Let, let me say, Deborah, let me say the uh, in the general sense. So we think voting is important regardless what, which party you're from when you vote. The voting by itself is a very important thing. So we're going to stand on our position of we will support if we find a place where you need more of machines and we have less need, we'll certainly have that conversation what we do ask is that those decisions come through our offices instead of through hotter's office uh, because we have some judges that we need to talk to when that happens uh, because of exactly what hotter just talked about we need to they, they aren't thinking about the whole day they're only thinking about the one day the other part of it though too is that uh, i think all of us need early voting maybe even stronger than we ever have because the problem last year was not here in early voting the problem last year was on the voting day is on the in march it was on election day itself if people would get out and early, don't end up with that rush on election day and and there was a reason that happened last time particularly on the democrat side because you had, it was it wasn't until toward the very end of the process that you even had your presidential candidates narrowed down to figure out who you were even voting for so i understood that wholeheartedly but just know that we, our position hasn't changed at all. If we end up in a position with machines, we're certainly willing to help out and um, and hope we can have that same in return. 
Yeah, no. And Rick, I think uh, you know that I said we want to work together. Uh, I, I agree with you. We have been really pushing early voting, and especially since the governor has now extended it the extra five days. I think if we can get people to come out, that will also help with social distancing, because if people go and vote early, there should be less of a crowd. So we're pushing uh, uh, anybody who is eligible to vote by mail. I did it. I am eligible to vote by mail and I mailed my ballot in yesterday. I have never voted by uh, mail because I like to go to the polling place, but I did it to take some of the pressure off election day voting. So we're pushing both that for those who are eligible and to go in person early voting. Yeah, and I guess the the, the, source, the the origin of the discussion was, you know, um, what happens if you're in this situation um, and, and you're seeing that you don't have enough? I mean, the machines are going to be there, okay? If, and this is part of the conversation we want to have with the judge, um, the judges. If you have someone who walks in and says, I went to machine number one, and then the second voter, um, and you have a little... You know, you don't have a lot of people there. You can tell them, go to machine number three, leave one in between you. So you don't necessarily have to be standing next to each other. But the math says, and the turnout from March says, at some point you will need those six machines that you have there. And, and I mean, the best example I can think of is the Diamond Hill Library, where we had uh, three and three. There's, there's no way to distance that equipment. I mean, you would have one each, literally. Um, and so, you know, and there was a line there. They were voting till 9 p.m. Uh, you know, if we give them only one, it's going to be midnight. They're st still going to be there. So uh, I know that there's been a lot of emphasis on everything has to be separated six feet apart. But um, seeing what's happened in other states, um, I think we need to, you know, again, try to educate the people on, you know, here's your sample ballot. Here are ways to go in and out faster. Wear your mask. Keep your distance in the line. And, um, you know, we, we have a contactless experience uh, to the extent it's possible. You still have to grab your paper, right? But, but we want a ballot paper, a paper ballot. So uh, just try to move quick through the polling place and prepare to vote. I think it's going to be yeah. Let me ask a question. I think it will be easier, though, because the ballot is much shorter. I had three selections on my ballot. And uh, I think in March, we had a very lengthy ballot and people had to go through multiple pages. And so I think that, you know, the ballot's going to be a lot shorter. I think, Rick, you have one race on there. I have potentially four and that will show up on everybody's race and then the city election. So they're going to have a lot fewer choices. Yeah. Hey, let, let me ask a question, maybe of the group on the six foot part of it. So when we're going, six foot is used, I'm not sure where or right now. When we see stuff going on in the streets, nobody's six feet apart. When we show up at events and we're sitting in auditoriums, we're sitting in every other seat and no seat is six foot wide. Um, and so I'm not sure, I, I guess I'm offering a little pushback maybe on the six foot requirement, but I'm, at, I'm very interested in hearing feedback from other people on that. I mean, even if, I even if from my, my perspective, Rick, what I would say is I hear what you're saying on the six foot. Uh, a lot of my determination on the six foot is whether or not the individuals are wearing masks. If uh, if they're basically saying we're not going to wear masks, then we need the six foot. Um, if they're wearing masks, then I'm not as concerned. And maybe we could set it up in such a way as to always have uh one that would be six foot away and then if somebody comes in and they don't want to wear a mask then say you okay you'll have to wait until that particular machine is available and then we'll uh you know so we'll put you in line for that machine and then the ones that are wearing masks can um can go ahead and and vote at any of the machines as they come open i i you know i'll say that's a good idea. Let me ask the state, um, because one of the other conversations that we had with them was um, what happens, you know, we have places that have been telling us we're taking everyone's temperature before they come into the room. Can't do that. The state has been very clear. You cannot put any process that limits the access of the voter to the ballot. So even if someone comes in and you were to take the temperature and they have a fever. 
I know, I know. I'm saying, I'm saying that they've been really um, adamant on, you know, nothing that intimidates or um, gives the voter any impression that they're being treated differently is something that they will support. So I want to ask him. This is, and I think it's a, it's a good idea worth at least exploring. Saying, hey, if you don't want to wear a mask, you're just gonna have to be in the isolated machine. We're not saying you can't. We're saying it may take longer, or you can grab one of the masks we're making available and get out of here quicker. I think it makes sense, but let me ask before we, we put that on the table. Hey, this is well, Marilyn. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not gonna have another meeting. What does everybody think about that? Do we have objections to that from the folks on the on the commission or on the board? So this is Mayor Louise. Um, my thoughts, I think we should keep as many as we can, even if it's three feet apart, I think the worst thing we can do to voters, I mean, if I was in the party and having those decisions, I think voters understand the inherent risk of going out and voting. They know the pandemic's there. Six feet is not really gonna magically make them any safer. I don't think they're gonna feel 100% safer. I go with Rick. I think for the Republican party, Rick, put all the machines out you can, even if it's three feet apart. The last thing we would want from the party is to say we took those machines down when you have a group of individuals. I didn't mind voting three feet apart and you literally made me wait out in July for all these hours because you decided three feet is the golden number. The governor, Ken Paxson, made it very clear they're trying to pass this crazy mess. And so I vote with all the machines. I think it's great, Judge Whitley, for comment, but when you got election are struggling to make the machine work and make things happen. Now you're telling John Q. Public, go stand over there. I'm isolating you because you won't follow you know, the rules. You're just going to have a lot of hot tempered July 4th people mad. And, and Mary Lou, this is Deborah. I'm just the opposite. I like Judge Whitley's idea of having a, 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 a one machine that is open for people who don't wear masks. If I go in a location and people don't have on a mask, I won't get close to them. I just will not. I, uh, I'm i in the age range that is uh, susceptible to COVID, and I don't want to be... Um, close to somebody who doesn't have on a mask. So I'm okay with three feet for a bunch of the machines, but I think I like the idea of having one machine for that person who refuses to wear a mask. And if they don't want to put on a mask, they have to wait. I, that's just my opinion on it. Well, and I don't mind there being more than just one machine, yeah. but what I'm saying is to spread all of them six feet apart uh, and, and reduce the number. You know, I, and I may be wrong. I think your, um, well, I, you know, your your big voter turnout is going to be in Fort Worth. I think because of the crime tax, okay. and um, and it's going to be in the I, well, it's going to be in the more heavily Democratic. You know, who is our uh, Rick? Who is the runoff for the Republicans? It's a state. Uh, it's a. Uh, um, Appeals court. So it's not. It, I mean, our our reality is that the turnout is going to be low, and we know that. We have that, and we have a precinct runoff, precinct chair runoff in Colleyville. That's all we have anywhere on the ballot. Yeah, and see, Judge, we have the U.S. Senate race on the ballot. I also have in 24, which is uh, part of Tarrant County, uh, Kim Olson and Candace Valenzuela in precinct five, which is kind of the north side. We have a constable runoff race, and then I have railroad committee, a statewide race. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, um, but what are y'all? What are any other comments with regards to having most of the machines three feet apart if somebody is wearing a mask? And if they're not wearing a mask, then maybe there's a couple of machines that are six feet apart. Potter, how difficult is that going to be? To and what happens when one of the it depends on the location. Part is broken. Go ahead, Mary Lou. What happens when one of the machines six feet apart? What if it goes down? You know, and, and we I, have one. You're gonna have to ask the governor. You're gonna have to ask the um, SOS about that. But I'll be surprised because. Deborah, I absolutely respect what you're saying, but I think they're probably going to come back and say, 
if you're in that older category, then you know you have absolutely the right to offer a, a mail-in ballot. I'll just be surprised if they do that because I think Hyder's going with the side they're going to be super conservative about blocking anybody's ability. But I hope they do it. But I'm just worried. You know, you're going to have a, a voter that's not going to want to be you know singled out, or the machine's going to go down. And now you've got you know, hang on, I got to move that machine. You got to come over here. No, I don't want to stand next to you. Kind of conversation. I don't know let me, how let me, difficult is that going to be? Uh, I don't think it's going to be difficult. It's going to. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to be a. I, it's not difficult per se. It's going to be talking to the um, the techs who do each location, and they know their places, and they'll tell us, you know, I can do it here. I can't do it there. Uh, again, Diamond Hill. It's probably a six by six room, so there's no way to do it. And I'm not kidding with that six by six. I'm, that's, I think it's literally six or seven by seven. It's a super small room where you can barely fit three machines. So it won't be possible in that one. Uh, we'll look into it. My concern is, and again, I, I, I'm going to run it by the state because we've asked questions like, what if someone comes in exhibiting symptoms? Can we tell them you have to vote curbside? And they said, nope, you cannot tell a voter that you're going to single them out and give them a different treatment, a different access to a different process to have access to the ballot. So even if someone comes in, you know, and say, yep, I have a fever and I'm sneezing and I'm not wearing a mask, they still have to be allowed into the polling place to vote. That's the way the law is written. I, I tell everyone to illustrate the point. You can't be wanted for murder. They'll have to let you vote first and then arrest you. Well, I'd almost rather you ask for forgiveness than permission. I disagree. So noted. Let me, let, uh, let me add something. That, so for those of you, most of you weren't a part of our conversation that we had that Deborah was talking about uh, right after the March election. So as a reminder, the law requires that if we have any machines for the Democrat party anywhere, the Republicans have to be there and vice versa. That when we went to voting centers, this is the requirement because there's plenty of places that we are very supportive of Deborah and the Democrats having multiple machines where we just know flat out we could probably get away with one machine and we might not even use it. Um, so I, I think I think we can almost come to a hybrid type conversation on this and that it, where Deborah needs more space, let's give her more space, give us our one machine uh, and, and move on with the deal. I, I do think that telling somebody that because you didn't wear a mask, you gotta go over and stand in that corner and vote on that machine. Our people, are, we're gonna have people on our side that are gonna go crazy on that in the same way that I think Deborah's going to have people that are going to show up like Deborah's saying and say, nobody has a mask on in there. I'm not going in. This isn't fair. And so we just need to come up with a hybrid type approach that that meets both needs. And, and again, there's plenty of place where we probably don't even need machines because we don't have voters there, but we have to because the way the law is set up for whenever you have an election there, you have everybody there. So I, I think we can work through all this with uh, with Deborah and I working with Hyder or our teams working with Hyder and make sure that it all works out to where it's comfortable for both parties. Hyder, let me ask a question. On these machines, will every machine be programmed for the Republican, the Democrat, and the city of Fort Worth? Hyder, I'm not hearing you. I'm trying to mute it, so I don't have no, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. They will have the programming much like we did in March. That's why, at you know, closer to the end of the day, you had judges who were seeing the other party in a crunch and were saying, here, take my equipment. You can do that. Um, in essence, remember that the duos, the ballot marker one, will take the configuration from the controller. So if you plug it into a Republican controller, it will issue a controller, a Republican ballot. And if you do it in a Democrat controller, it will do the same thing. So it is doable. So then what I would suggest is, is that we let uh, Rick and Deborah and Hyder work through this to what they feel like is the best approach and, uh, and, and let, them, let them do that. This is very much the conversation we had after March and we're okay. I think Deborah, at least I, I think I'm okay with having that conversation with the three of us. The thing that we don't want to do is to say you can use every machine for either party. Right now, it works in the Democrats' favor because they, but next time it might be in our, it's not fair to the other party for us to lock up all the machines with our line 
when we have two people sitting there going about on one issue. Uh, they ought to be able to bop in and bop out, and we're going to have standing line behind folks that have a longer longer ballot. And so, um, but to answer your question, Judge, I think the three of us can probably work through this and get it figured out pretty easily. Huh. Okay. Um, any other questions or discussion about this about this particular runoff coming up? I know, Hotter, we've got to do some stuff on the election board as far as um, some of these things um yeah we got to approve the members of the ballot board okay so um I, I, yeah, judge can i ask one more really i think it's gonna be a fast question sure I, on the mask and shield is it a mask or for, i'm talking about for the workers everywhere i've seen shields being used it's an option to not have to wear the mask uh, we we're not going to mandate them to use all three. We're going to give them all three, and then you know if you want to use the mask, use a mask. If you want to use a mask and shield, use both. If you want to use only the shield, I mean, it's we're giving you ways to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's been a question even posted to the state. Again, it's one of those that can't mandate them to wear the mask. Fair enough. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks. I have one more question. Yes. And Rick, and for Rick and Deborah, and, and I don't know, Hyder, um, Rick, is there, when we have these elections and you have people coming in trying to get verified, is it impossible when you have a voter that is challenged trying to get that verification, Has is it even possible, Hyder, to, to have them move over to somewhere else instead of literally holding the line up and, you know, holding 10 people who could, you know, fast track through there? Is that even possible or it's just you're next and if it took you 30 minutes and five judges to make it happen, you're just gonna be that person in line. Have y'all ever side fast track? Okay, here's a table for the ones that just, I can't get this right, it's not, <laughs> by the time you get to a provisional ballot, you say, here, dear God, just please vote and we'll deal with it later. Or that's not possible. That's, that's supposed to be the procedure. That's how they're trained. If you have someone who you look up and it, hey, it looks like this is a provisional, they're supposed to, cancel the check-in process in the poll book, pull them to the side and say, start filling out all of these forms. And when you're ready, come back and, you know, we'll jump you in between two people and, and, and get you through. Um, so again, it's one of those things we reiterate in the training, the, the, the voters that require more dedicated attention, put them to the side, do the paperwork and don't hold out the line while you're processing it. It is yeah. part of the training. Yeah, and Mary Lou, this is Deborah. I was going to tell you that that is the process, and I have seen it happen. I have seen the judge uh, who was there say, I need you to step over here and to keep the line moving. So hopefully they are paying attention to the training. I know I've seen that happen, but uh, Jida, that's a good idea just to make sure we remind the judges. Yeah, I totally and, agree. Yeah. And one thing we may be looking at, again, and we'll see a little bit about the CARES Act funds, is seeing if... Um, if it's if they're eligible for buying more po more poll books precisely to do that to give them a uh let's call it dedicated station and keep the line flowing we're like an exception station if you wish for provisionals for canceling ballots for all these things that take some time because we know that um that 80 85 percent of people who check in regularly probably 90 percent they are in and out in 30 seconds of a poll book 45 seconds a minute at most if you scan their license, but then you have someone who holds the line for seven minutes and that's where it starts building up, right? Uh, and also to do curbside, you know, if you have two or three units in a polling place, having that same unit dedicated to go curbside with that one because and we keep the, the line flowing at the rate we can, it helps a lot. Yeah, and the judges, I will tell you all, hate curbside because it's very cumbersome and heavy. And a lot of our judges are older and they that is one of the things they complain about a lot is uh, having, you know, taking the equipment out for curbside. So Hyder, anything we could do to help encourage people, if you're over 65, vote by mail is what we're telling them or vote early. So because the judges just say that is very, the equipment is heavy. It is, it is, and um, I, I've said this in, in, in other meetings and other places, um, none of the vendors really had a curbside design. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they even came into the bids and said, paper ballot. Well, yeah, but if we have paper ballot, we can't have vote centers. And so um, our vendors, the last time I talked to them, 
Um, they said they were in the process of designing a smaller, lighter machine that might be available in 2021 for curbside to make it easier. So you don't even need the cart or anything, but that's that's going to be a project in itself to, to tackle. For now, um, it was basically a choice of do we figure out a way to carry this heavy machine outside or do we have paper ballots and not have vote centers? Okay, so that kind of wraps up. I moved up one slide to, you know, the, the way the polling place is going to flow and what's going to happen there. We'll be looking into that, um, separating the equipment and have that conversation through um, the day on July 14th to see where we can offset any lines or anything that, that may be happening. So the last part I want to show you is um, the CARES Act funds, you know, the money we got. And, and what are we using it for and what is the plan for November, right? Because November is going to be incredibly different from July. So the CARES Act gave Texas $24 million, a little over $24 million, and uh, the state distributed amongst counties. It requires a 20% match. So we were awarded $1.7 million with a condition of matching another $352,000. The good news is the state said you can use Chapter 19, which is another state grant, to match. So in essence, we've got $2.1 million to use uh, that did not come out of county budget. We've offset one grant with the other to build up the whole thing. That's good. Um, I just put the bullet points there. The funds can be used for these five things. The definitions within those are very specific. It's not just about anything, uh, but it basically allows us to buy more equipment to have shorter lines, more people to help you know, uh, uh, control the lines and for social distancing. Uh, security and training on how to use PPE, uh, communications to inform voters and supplies, you know, all, all the sanitizing products, hand sanitizer, towels, all that. So what's our plan? We, we want to make sure that we, looking down to November, we address two things, possible increases in absentee voting, and but, but we don't want to go all in crazy on absentee voting and, and neglect in-person in voting, right? So the two things have to happen. Um, there is no way to do just one of them. Right, you, you need both to happen. So in absentee voting, our challenge is, we know, we don't know what might look like. Uh, we're already seeing on this primary runoff, we are close to 30,000 ballots mailed out. Uh, in the last presidential, we had 21. So there is an increase. There are people who would have preferred to vote in person who are now using this um, tool they have. Um, and there are people who are out of the county taking care of relatives or college students who you know are just staying where they are because they don't want to or can't travel anyway there's a larger volume and then um you know we, we're kind of in an unfair position in elections because you don't know what law might change because of a court order and might put us in a higher impossible to manage volume but we're still going to be asked to figure out a way right so how do we do this we broke down the the issue into two areas we need to tackle. If you're going to have more ballots, basically means you have to put more ballots out in the mail and you have to handle more more ballots out coming, more ballots coming back. So we have to send out more, we have to be able to process more in return. When a ballot is sent out, we have two personalized items to handle, the voter's ballot and what we call the carrier, the return envelope, right? That yellow one where you put the ballot in, that one has the voter's address and a barcode on it that, that, that is what allows us to make sure that you don't vote twice. So if Hyder gets a ballot and then calls in and sends another application and says, you know, my ballot never got here, send me another one, we cancel the first one and we send you a second ballot with a second carrier with a different barcode. So if you return the first one, it gets kicked out and said, this one's canceled. You're supposed to vote the second one, right? And then those two elements get inserted and mailed to the person in a packet that has some other letters and some documents. So to print more ballots, we're buying more ballot printers. We're, we're doubling our capacity. Here we have right now three printers. We use mainly two and we keep a reserve one. We're buying one more so that worst case we can have four running simultaneously and uh, be able to generate to produce double the amount of ballots we're doing right now. We're buying a faster and upgraded um, carrier envelope printer. That's the one that prints the barcodes and the uh, voter's address uh, that personalizes that. And that one, we, look, we looked for one. We already placed the order with the, the vendor we selected, Pitney Bowes, uh, has the ability of putting the intelligent mail barcode on every piece. And, uh, and I'll tell you in a minute why that's important. And we're, we're also upgrading and buying a faster and more powerful inserter. So the goal here is basically to double our capacity. We were able to do about 3,000 ballots on a busy day, get them out the door. We should be able to get hit at least five, if not six, or maybe even more. 
uh, request to be able to get more ballots out the door. Now, um, again, my job is to think about scenarios and workflows. What if something changes in the law and we don't have 50,000 requests on September 15 to get out the door, but 200, 300, 400,000? We're also putting out a bid, um, as I was here, my staff was in a pre-bid conference to outsource the ballot printing. So if we have half a million ballots to get out on you know, E minus 45, what we do is we don't try to print them and get them out the door in-house because we won't be able to. We'll grab that list, we'll give it to a certified print shop by the Secretary of State and we tell them, you print them and put them in the mail for us. And then we would just deal with the um, supplementary incoming smaller weekly or daily orders. So that would give us the, the ability to get a lot out the door, whether because we do it or because we outsource it. And option two, the outsourcing doesn't cost us anything. It's a contract we're gonna have. If we never place an order, no, no, no harm there. When they come back, the ballots, every ballot has to be, we have to scan the envelope to figure out, you know, is this ballot canceled or not? Did you already vote? Who does it belong to? The signature board and the ballot board have to verify the signature and then we can pull the ballot and get it counted. So to scan more, um, we're looking for one of these machines. It's a mail ballot sorter and I'm going to just make sure I mute this. Here we go. This is a video from uh, station, but I, I, I struggled to find one that wouldn't show any vendor because we're in a bidding process. But the goal is basically to do this, to put the mail pieces in a machine that does high speed scanning, classifying and sorting. Now, this is a slow motion section. I don't know how much you can see there, um, but basically as the ballot goes through the machine and it does five or six a second, uh, it snaps a picture. And based on what it reads on the barcode, it says, oh, wait, this one is canceled. Let me put it in a different, what they call pockets, which is what you're gonna see in the next section, right? I know you don't, I don't know how much you can see in the video, how fast it goes, but see the ballots come out of that part where the picture's taken, and then the machine decides what pocket it lands on. And so we can configure things like, uh, let me see if there's another shot here, where they do this, here. We can de decide things like, pocket 17 is for the no signatures. Pocket 19 is for precinct one ballots. Pocket 21 is for uh, canceled ballots, right? So the point with this is that we have the ability to do, how do I get out of this video? Here we go. We have the ability to do in, um, in maybe one hour what we would be doing in five or six. Okay, so that's, that's why we're looking for that. Uh, that's the most expensive of the purchases we're looking at right now. We think it's gonna be somewhere around $300,000. I'm gonna skip the video. So after those ballots have been scanned and sorted and organized, they're given to the ballot board. We're doubling the number of stations we have. Uh, so we would go from six to potentially 12 pairs of Republicans and Democrats going through ballots at the same time, um, get more work done. And finally, we're adding you know, an additional high-speed scanner. So again, we can count more ballots, right? Because we have received more, we've scanned more, we've verified more signatures, now we just count more ballots also. Uh, and so that's the general plan with how do we, you know, how do we intend to tackle a potentially higher volume of absentee ballots? Okay, so all of that together right now, we're estimating is gonna cost us about $700,000 of those 2.1 million. That leaves about $1.4 million for uh, in-person voting, which is a lot. And, and we wanna make sure that we have money to invest in that. Some of this money is gonna be used to reimburse the products we have bought for July, like. Um, hand sanitizer and these uh, uh, COVID related expenses, but it leaves a lot of money for making sure that in-person voting in November can be, um, I guess you can say beefed up appropriately. So what are we gonna do for in-person voting? Number one, learn from July. We need to make sure that we see what happens in July, that we see those protocols, that we um, see the reaction to, uh, you know, the machines can't be guaranteed to be six feet apart. And then we'll have a conversation of, do we need more machines, more locations? Do we need more uh, PPE for voters? I mean, we're gonna have to see how that goes and learn from it. Um, this is not my decision. I know that before the judge tells me, I know it's the court's decision, but I'm just reminding everyone the court decided not to reduce locations when we went to vote centers. So, and I'm saying this because what I've seen in other states is um, Kind of a bet to say let's go all in vote by mail and let's reduce locations and, and and you see that in georgia you see that in maryland 
that kind of backfired into five, six hour long lines because there weren't enough polling places. So I do think this is something we need to keep in place and make sure that we say, you know, if more people vote by mail, great, but we're gonna assume that we need to have the same locations and the same services to make sure everybody gets through on election day. Um, we do need to reach out to all the entities. Both party chairs are here, county judge. Um, we need places where people can vote. And it's really difficult to have 340 locations if our schools are telling us, you can't use the gym, you're gonna use the lobby. You just cut my number of machines in half. If our city halls are telling us, you can't use the big room, you got it. So we really need people and entities to understand if we don't have the big areas and the availability to work and, and to, to make the equipment available, that's gonna ultimately hurt voters. Um, so that's gonna be something with conversation I'm gonna start, but I would appreciate all the help I can get on that. We have enough money to buy PPE based on what we have, what we spent so far, that's not a concern. We'll just have to see uh, recruiting, how it goes between now and July. And um, I'm not a medical expert. I don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. Some people say the summer's quieted down a little bit, we'll see. But so we just gotta keep an eye on how people react to this in the fall. If there's another spike, uh, that might be the challenge. And we may have to come up with some creative ideas to find that. And that is all I have. I have a question about recruiting. Yes, ma'am. I'm reading in the uh, different papers that, you know, people are not taking, you know, unemployment opportunity jobs because they've got, you know, extra income coming in from the federal government. Are you finding some of your workers that you would say, hey, come work saying, no, not this time around? Not yet, but I did ask the Secretary of State that question. They were supposed to be consulting with um, the Texas Workforce Commission, and I say that right, to see if they could exempt poll worker duty from um, being a, a job that can disqualify you from unemployment. Because we did have one temp, that's what started the discussion, one temp who said, this doesn't, doesn't make sense for me to come in between the, um, what they call it, the stimulus package and the unemployment and this and that, I make more money staying home. So we wanna make sure that that gets off the table as a factor and said, look, this won't affect your eligibility for those programs. So um, I'll follow up on that conversation soon, but it could be a factor for November. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, Hyder, I believe you have, um, three or four things that need to be approved. Do you want to go ahead and go down your agenda? Yes, sir. So for the uh, ballot board, switching to the agenda here, we have um, two items. Items two, th number three is uh, the approval of Hyder Garcia, Tarrant County Elections Administrator as responsible for procurement of the election supplies for the November 3rd, 2020 election for 5103 of the elections code. Move approval, Emily. Second. So who was the motion? I'm sorry. Whitley was the motion. Peoples, Peoples was, was the second. second. Perfect, okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. And then I have uh, item number four is the approval per 87002 and 87027 of the elections code of the appointment of Republican Party appointee Kelly Robertson as the presiding judge of the early voting ballot board and signature verification committee, the Democratic appointee Kat Cano as the alternate judge of early voting of the early voting ballot board and signature verification committee vice chair, and the members of the early voting ballot board and signature verification committee as recommended by the Tarrant County political parties. The lists um, were distributed to the members of the board. That is the item in question. I move approval of this motion. We got second. a motion from Chair Peoples. We got a second from Chair Barnes. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Wait a minute. Who was the opposed? No, Mary Lou yeah. said aye. Hi. Well, Mary Lou, she's not on the election board, it, um, so it's it's the sheriff, Hyder, the two party chairs, and the judge for the board. The commission um, doesn't vote on this part. And that motion carried. 
So the motion right. again, the motion was by Chair Peoples, the second was by Chair Barnes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any any opposed? Don't seem to. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. And that's what I had uh, in my agenda. Do we have any questions or comments, I guess, for the board? No, I just judge and Are there any questions for the anybody from the commission? No, Judge Whitley, I just want to talk to you offline. Okay, it'll probably be tomorrow. Um, any other business at this time? Then I will um, adjourn the election submission. And I will adjourn the election board. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you all. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Natalie, I'm going to hit stop the recording. That's perfect. All right, goodbye, everyone. Bye.